Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. We've enjoyed a beautiful day. We're thankful for the opportunity we have to assemble here tonight and to sing these praises. Father, what a great church this is, and we are glad to glorify and magnify your name through song, through teaching, through prayer, through reading scripture. Father, it's great to be a Christian. We uh, invite you into our meeting tonight, Father. We want so much to have hearts that yearn for you and hearts that self, that set self aside and put you on the throne and even put others above ourselves. That's the challenge oftentimes, Father. We pray that you'll help us in that endeavor. We recognize there may be some here tonight that are not able to be here and uh, because of illness or other challenges. So we pray, Father, those obstacles can be removed. We want to pray especially uh, for our brother Ron Cole. We're glad that he is able to be home from the hospital. We pray that uh, he is getting the care that he needs. And uh, there are many others we could mention tonight, Father. But thank you for blessing us with this opportunity this evening. We ask you to open our minds and our hearts, open our lives, open our will to your will, Father. This is our prayer to Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 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 Philippians chapter 2 is where we will be examining the eight verses there that talk about the selfless servant, Jesus Christ. To set the tone tonight, we'll let you know about the story. It's actually a real thing that happened. Kind of be cool if my granddaughter was in here to hear this, but maybe we can have her. Oh, there's her mom, though. She can hear the story. Uh, so we were uh, at a uh, crack, no, not cracker, bro. We were at a Golden Corral restaurant, and we were with uh, Cass and Dorina, and uh, you, okay, he's resonating, resonating with the story already, I don't know, so, or you like buffets, is that what it is? Okay. Gold, golden Corral. Golden Corral. Ooh, yeah. Well, I won't say anything about the food, the drawback is it's lamp food, okay, it's lamp food, but it's still pretty good. Anyway, we had a good time because we were with the people that we wanted to be with, not necessarily because it was a restaurant I wanted to be at, but everybody has their own estimation of buffets, but ah, let's just drop it. Let's just talk about what happened. So we were with Cass and Dorina. Dorina's not in here yet, but she may still be coming a little late. Uh, and uh, after we had eaten our meal, we were going out of the restaurant. And just as you go out the door, they strategically have these quarter machines, you know, that you put a couple quarters in, and you crank it around, and it has a little plastic ball and a little toy inside, you know, and that's there for the kids, you know, and I don't mess with that stuff, even the granddaughter, I, I, I don't believe in spoiling kids, but anyway, Cass, he wants to make sure that his two kids are, uh, are you know, uh, they get a toy, okay, and so because... Bella's with us as well, well, he wants to get her a toy, too. And so, what faces are you making over there, Adam? Anyway, <laughs> so he puts these quarters in, and uh, out of all the toys in there, I couldn't believe it, the one that my granddaughter, Bella, wanted, it actually came out. I mean, there could have been like 30 other toys that were in there, and she got exactly the one she wanted. She was so excited. She was holding it up. Yeah, I got the one. I don't know, some ugly little stick man, like a puppy doll or something, you know. And she was just so happy. She got the one that she wanted. So then it was Cass's turn to get something for, for his daughter, Isabella. And he put two quarters in, cranked it around. They lifted up the lid. There was nothing. The machine malfunctioned. No, no toy. It was all no problem, no problem. Two more quarters, right? Cranks it around, opens it up. Nothing again. Wow. And she's starting to cry, you know. Uh, you know granted that uh, Isabella, is, his daughter, is much younger than our granddaughter. She's like first grade. Our granddaughter's fourth grade. But anyway, so she's just going to pieces because she didn't get her toy, right? Well, then he tried a third time. He cranked it around, opened up a little lid, and out came this really ugly toy. <laughs> and now she's really pitching a fit, right? Ah! <laughs> And here's Bella, our Bella, watching her. And actually, Isabella wanted the exact toy that our Bella got. And so Bella's looking at her crying, and she goes, you know what? You can have mine. And she gave it to her. 
Yeah. And she was ecstatic. She just threw the other toy down. <laughs> and there's Bella. I can even see it in her eyes. She's thinking, did I really want to give up that toy? You know? But I did it because this is my friend, and she's sad, and she wanted to make her happy. Yes, the idea of being selfless. The idea of giving somebody else joy, even when it might take away your joy. Philippians chapter 2. Hope you're there. Let's begin reading in verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, some translations say of one purpose. Verse 3. Let nothing, we'll underline that word nothing, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Verse 5. Well, let's really ratchet this up. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient, the point of death, even the death of the cross. As we consider what it means to be selfless, hopefully you have an outline you're looking at right there, let's talk about the three D's. This is my 3D lesson here tonight. Three D's, your desires, your denial, and your devotion. I want to start by looking at the opening <coughs> sentence here in verse 1. Consolation in Christ, comfort, Fellowship of the Spirit, affection and mercy. Are those things yours here tonight? Do those things belong to you? Do you, do you, do you have a consolation in Christ? Do you, do you have comfort in God? Do you have companionship? Companionship of the Spirit that's even here tonight as we associate as brothers and sisters in Christ. Are those blessings yours? And I would even say not only yes, they're ours in abundance. Better than we deserve, these blessings are ours. So it's really kind of a rhetorical statement to say, if you've got all those things, then you should be able to do this. It's a grant that we have those things. And if we have those things, look at verse 2. Paul says to the Philippian saints, and this is really to us as well, he says, then fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. There's a word in this text here, verse 2. Does a motive pop out in your mind? Does a, a major thing that we should feel and act upon in our hearts? Does it, does there, is there something here? Let me give you a hint. It's a four letter word, starts with L. That's the motive behind what he's asking us to do. That's easy. It's love. The motive is love. Um, I'm reminded of Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, where Paul writes, the love of Christ compels us. I want you to think about that for a minute. Does the love of Christ compel you? What does that mean, compel? And how does that take, uh, uh, what's the picture in your life of the love of Christ compelling you? What does that mean? Is that happening in your life? What does it look like? How does it play out? You've got the love of Christ. Does it compel you? What does that mean to, to compel you? Anybody have a different, uh, uh, well, if we're not at that text, we're going to say, instead of in 2 Corinthians 5.14, compel, maybe, oh, I know, the NIV, I think, says constrains me, or constrains you. Love of Christ constrains us. What do you think of that? 
Has it ever constrained you? Has it ever compelled you? Has it ever pushed you, motivated you? And in what way did it do that? Particularly, by the way, as it relates to our relationships within the body of Christ. And if we're a true member, what does that look like amongst our church family, our brothers and sisters? John? Yeah. Sometimes I think uh, if we're thankful enough for what Christ has done for us and the love he shows us, we feel, I wouldn't say obligated, but we feel necessary to show that same characteristic to other people. So I'm, it's like he's, he's pulling me, <laughs> like with a string or something, in that direction. Dragging, pulling, dragging pushing, me. prodding. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, you caused me to think about uh, Hebrews 10.24. Let us, he say, consider one another to stir one another up to love and good works. Provoke one another. Does that the love of Christ provoke you? I mean, think about uh, the example I gave you with Bella. Uh, I'd like to think, even though she's a young girl that has a lot to learn about the church and everything, but I'd like to think somehow, some way, her exposure here to the church, even though she's only nine years old, something was compelling. Maybe it was love of Christ. Maybe it's just love of God as best as she knows what that is. But it caused us to act differently than we normally would act. If we were just thinking of the world, if she was just thinking of the world that day, she'd say, I got my toy, I don't care about you. But something was pushing her to have a different activity. And she even calls, my, you know, Bella, our granddaughter, even calls uh, all of you my brother, my sister. She, I don't know, she got that from Erica, I think, or something. And so, even though she's not baptized, and Isabella, a first grader, is not baptized, she says, that's my sister. So that, that was compelling. This is a family thing. Hmm. Gary? Um, when a person puts on Christ, they immediately receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You need to understand the Holy Spirit is active in a Christian's life, and it compels them <coughs> to do what Jesus wants us to do. So sometimes we just don't think of that, but the Holy Spirit is very much at work. And those that are in Christ. Now, I want to talk about that a little bit. We're kind of going a little different direction. When you got saved, go back to that day when you were baptized, when you got saved, what was your desire? What desire did you have? What was the thing you wanted to do? To obey God. To obey God. I would say most people want to go to heaven. Okay. And that was the desire maybe to get saved, and then how about the desire they would have after they got saved? Now I got heaven, I punched my ticket. What's my desire? What am I seeking first? Seeking first the kingdom of God, loving God, wanting to obey Him? Telling somebody else. Pardon? Telling somebody else. Yes. You know, uh, it was simple. We we all learned this when we were in uh, when we were in Sunday school. Some of us that were in there. Remember joy? What does that stand for? Jesus, others, yourself. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. True is going to get upset with me. I'm going to press that. <laughs> I'm not supposed to touch it for you. For That's okay. Um, okay. Um, look again. Uh, somebody has the NIV. Uh, read verse 2. If I can get somebody who's got the New International Version. Read verse 2. Philippians 2. two. Then say? make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Okay, I thought it wasn't the NIV then. One said, being of the same spirit and of the same purpose. NIV does say that. My NIV. Oh, you're not, do you have NIV? Maybe you got the different uh, 1984 NIV, huh? But anyway, one version says... One spirit and one purpose. So, pardon me? Mind. One purpose, one mind. Uh, what is your purpose? What is your purpose? Why, why are you living today? To serve God. To serve God. To glorify God. To please God. And the way we do that 
Jesus, remember, said the greatest commandment. You want to please God? Love him with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And God made it easy for us in the church to love our neighbor because he gave us brother and sister relationships within the body to learn love here so then we can go out people that are a little easier to love. Then we can go out in the world and love some of the people that are a little more difficult to love. It's giving us training wheels right here but to learn how to love people. People that are just slightly a little bit more lovable, most of the time we are, right, than, than the people in the world. Love your neighbor as yourself. Neighbor is anybody near to you. In the church, we have friends, family that are near to us. Now, one of the other things we're looking at when it talks about uh, one spirit or one purpose, one accord, one mind, we're also talking about unity. And we did talk about unity as far as what it means to be a member of the Church of Christ and have unity in the body. Here's unity right here. What we have as our basis to love each other, then we're able to be on the same page, to be of one, amount, one mind, one accord, all those things right there. So the, the, the desire we should have is to love each other from the heart, love God and love each other. Now, let's, um, hold, well, let's go to verse 3 now. Verse 3 he says, let nothing be done, well that's a strong word, nothing, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, there's the mind again, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. So, lowliness of mind, that's what the New King James says in verse uh, 3. Lowliness of mind. Uh, what does that look like? Humility. Humility. And uh, that can be a tough go for some of us because at the root pretty much of all sin is the word pride. It's funny how if you take the word pride, what's the middle letter in pride? I. What's the middle letter in sin? I. And it's hard for us to put others before ourselves and I am last. God first, others, then myself. That's, that's difficult to do. To, and he's not saying here that we need to think less of ourselves, but he's telling us we need to think of ourselves less, to think more of others. And honestly, you know, we really, I know you don't want to admit it, but you really like yourself. <laughs> First thing you thought of this morning when you got up is, I'm going to take care of self. I'm going to get some breakfast. I'm going to get a shower. I'm going to brush my teeth. I'm going to comb my hair. I'm going to put on some nice clothes. All, it was all about you today when you got up at the very beginning, and then you went out into the world, and God says, now put yourself aside and have lowliness of mind. Think of others and put their interests above yours. You know, when we talk about unity in the church, one of the challenges we face, and we see this as, as church leaders, elders, deacons, preachers, we have our meetings, and we try to decide on how we're going to do certain things in the church, and it's very difficult for us to make sure that we don't let our, that you don't let your church be about your preferences, what you would like to see. Instead, you're thinking about what the whole wants to see. Sometimes, really, really, not even sometimes, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. So now we're trying to make a decision as how we're going to do things in the church, and we have these meetings, and we're thinking, I know I'd like it this way, but maybe I'm going to have to bite my lip on this one and let the church leadership do something different as far as the worship, as far as the songs that are sung, as far as whatever it is that we're doing as a church. I need to make sure that my preferences take a back seat and I'm actually more concerned about the preferences of others. That's a tough one. Because if you're going to tell me how to preach, <laughs> and you're going to tell me <laughs> how to do my job, I know you're not going to do that, but if you're going to advise me in certain ways, I may God, uh, that might be something that I resist a little bit. And I have to humble myself and say, okay, I really thought I should do it this way. This brother or sister saying, you ought to consider this. And I need to think of their interests above my own. I might have to change my style of preaching. I might have to do something different with regard to the church. Now, this is a sense of vision. Um, so, let's see. 
You know, if you don't think that this can happen, or at least maybe you say to yourself, well, it certainly never would have happened uh, with Jesus' disciples. <coughs> Can you think of a time when the disciples uh, have a little me first attitude? Let's do this. I, I, I didn't plan on doing this, but let's go over to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Hold your place there in Philippians. What was that now? Yeah, that was. I think this is the one. If it's not, that's one of them, but I think this is one. I can't remember how exactly the details of this. Mark 9. Uh, I want to start somewhere around verse 30 something or other. Mark chapter 9. My pages are stuck together. Still a new Bible for them here. Mark 9, verse, uh, let's see. How about we start at verse 33? First, this is not Mark 9, 33. They came to Capernaum, and when Jesus was in the house, of, he asked them, he says, What were you, or what was it uh, you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, and they're embarrassed. They kept silent. For on the road, they disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. <laughs> and verse 35, Jesus sat down. He called the twelve and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. I just see their jaws drop. What? I've got to put everybody else first and I have to be the last person in line? That's greatness, being humble? Yes, brother, brother. I think a lot of times, because the world we live in, in the, in the mindset of the world we live in, is so totally different than in the mindset of Christ, that we think about when we read something like this, we think about that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Mm -hmm. We think about, okay, if I'm, a, if I'm a Christian, then I'm going to go to the back of the line, and then God's going to come get me and take me to the front of the line. And that's what our mindset is, and that's not what he's saying at all. God's saying that if you're going to go to the back of the line, and you're going to be a servant. This is so good that he brought this up, because let's think about this. If we ever get the humility to say, I'll be at the back of the line, secretly in our minds we're wishing that somehow that's going to be a benefit to us. It's maybe going to make us look better in the eyes of others. You know, that's where the pride thing is. Yeah. How is being last going to benefit me, or how about if I can be last and I don't get any benefit out of it at all? Zero. You know, uh, being humble, being last, that is ministry, not manipulation. We're not just doing it so that we'll look good or it'll some way benefit us. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about unity. Let's go, we're in Philippians. Go over to Galatians chapter 5. I love what Paul says here about being a servant and being last and being humble and, well, I'll just read the text. It's in Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 13. This is Galatians 5, 13. He says, For you, brethren, you've been called to liberty. That's freedom, right? He says, Only don't use that freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through, here it is, through love, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But, Look at verse 15. This is what can happen. He says, if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I know that everyone in here, you've never been in a local congregation anywhere at any time where you've seen them biting and devouring one another. Now, you know that's a lie. I've been doing ministry for 35 years, and I've seen some ugly brethren and sisterin arguing with each other, biting and devouring one another, wanting church preferences to be theirs, and not saying, I'll do it your way, and giving in to somebody else. Sometimes we argue and fight about the silliest things. Oh, I better not go there. <laughs> All right. Hmm. Oh, by the way, going back over to Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 3. I like the way the, the, the King James Version, I believe, has, interprets verse 3, or puts the right word there. Verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. I believe it's the King James Version. Instead of selfish ambition, it says, Let nothing be done through strife. I'm doing this because I want it this way, and I don't care if it causes strife. 
That's what some people would do, even in church work. And it's a lowliness of mind that says, I really want to function in such a way that my actions, my activities, my thoughts about the way we should do church is going to produce peace where possible, because it's not always possible. Paul said that, you can't have peace. It's not always possible, Romans 12, 18. But he did say, Jesus said, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, he said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. Peace. Sometimes swallowing your pride, having a low mind and putting the interests of others above your own. Yeah, that's a challenge. Unity, love. Our desires need to be based on love, and our desires must be come within the framework of every single one of us having a lowliness of mind. I can't believe how that time has gotten away on me. I didn't get to point number two. We've got to cover two. Let's look at the example of Jesus, and we'll just have to pick this up next week. This is Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. I love this. Some versions don't say mind. It says attitude. Let this attitude or mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And here's his example, verse 6. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Then it goes on to say, he took on the form of a servant. But I'll stop there. Our model is Christ. You know, uh, I believe that it's so difficult for us to have loneliness of mind, to be selfless, that the only way we're really going to be able to grasp this is to read about the life of Jesus, to see it modeled. Jesus was our model. Christ was the model. He had an attitude. His attitude was, and I imagine this was very hard for him to do because he's the creator of the universe. He was equal with God in the beginning, and he didn't consider it something to be held on to. He let go of it and came down and gave up that equality taking on the form of a human, being tempted at all points as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15, he gave up that deity. He's still equal with God, but he gave up certain privileges. Being tempted was one of them. Being, uh, being a person that could, be, that could bleed, that could hurt, that could suffer, that could sympathize. These are the things that Jesus went through. He had the attitude of self-denial. Remember Jesus, and you know, this was another occasion where the disciples were trying to jockey for position, trying to be a little bit better than somebody else. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, he said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve his, to serve others and give his life a ransom for many. That's the attitude. Jesus had an attitude of self-denial. And he calls his Disciples, those who would follow him. He says, if you want to follow me, what, uh, Luke 9, 23, he says, take up your cross. Deny yourself. Follow me. Wow, tough act to follow, really. Uh, we'll talk about this next week, and I, just, I think I'll just leave it right here. But you got two seven. more minutes. That's four minutes fast. Good, good. Thank you for being on that. Um, let's see, where was it? Where, where, where does it say he emptied himself? Well, you know, it's not in the New King James. Uh, but in one of the, first, I think it's verse 7, it says that he emptied himself. Uh, when was the last time you emptied yourself? And, and what again, what, what does that mean? Empty yourself. You know, some of us that are married, we know what that's like at times, right? <laughs> To empty yourself, to let your spouse have their way, all the way, and you don't get any piece of the pie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, we'll have marriage counseling later on, okay? <laughs> oh boy, you did it now. We're a doghouse for you tonight. <laughs> empty yourself. Was that? You empty yourself? Yeah. Huh. Strong language. You know, going back to Jesus' example, 
He is equal with God. He came, and he was in heaven with all the glory, all the prestige, sitting at the right hand of God. He had everything equal with God. He emptied himself. And, and you know, I just imagine that being a human being, that he must have had, well, I know it kind of comes out in his desert duel with the devil in Matthew 4, where he's tempted three times by the devil after he fasted 40 days. And the devil's even saying, hey, if you're the son of God, do this. If you're God's son, do this. So you can pull yourself down. You can, uh, the angels are going to take care of you. And I just, I'm just going to say this. I think that Jesus had the temptation to show off. I'll show you who I am. You ever had that temptation in your life? When you know you could really do something, and somebody else is there, and you have a loneliness of mind, and you're not going to show off, and you're going to let them even look better than you, when you could have you could have bowled a better game than that, but you let them, I don't know, whatever it is, right? You emptied yourself, and you let someone else be better. You could have showed off, and you just said, no, nope, I'm going to make them look good. Yes? You just made me think of when he said, uh, don't you know, if I called out to my father, he was in more than, you know, that right there. Uh, yep. Exact. And remember the Garden of Gethsemane? He is struggling with wanting to do what he would rather do as a human being so much that when he's saying, not my will, but your will, and he's sweating drops of blood. That's how agonizing the blood is coming. He's emptying himself. Before the blood, even on the cross, he's already bleeding when it comes to giving up his will to do the Father's will. Even the men were calling him, you know, you are the son of God, and he made them shut up. Mm -hmm. You know, he couldn't reveal himself at all. And I, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but see now verse 8 says that he not only, what's it saying verse 8? It says at the end, uh, yeah. he not only uh, became obedient to the point of death, but death. not just any other ordinary death, death of the cross. cross. We'll have to save that for next week. I'm going over already a few minutes, so let's go ahead and put our marker there. We'll come back part two on this lesson number five. If you want to take it home, fold it up, stick it in your Bible, or just uh, leave it in there a few. We'll bring it back, and we'll do uh, part two next week.